All right, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Announcing Open Source GRPC Kotlin. I'm Christy Tan, Marketing Communications Manager at CNCF. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, James Ward, Developer Advocate at Google Cloud Platform. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenter. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to James to kick off today's presentation. Great, thank you, Christy. Thank you everyone for joining us today. So as Christy said, I'm James Ward. I work at Google and we're gonna be talking about an announcement that we just made yesterday about the open sourcing of gRPC Kotlin. So I wanted to start out with just a little bit of an overview of Kotlin for those of you that might not be familiar with it and then do a little bit of an overview of gRPC and then we'll get into the gRPC Kotlin announcement. And uh, please ask questions as we go through. Uh, we have a number of people that have are behind this open source project also on today and uh, they will help answer questions during and then also at the end of the presentation. So, um, so ask away. All right, so let's start with a little bit of an overview of Kotlin and what it looks like if you haven't seen it before. Uh, Kotlin is a newish programming language and it has a syntax that's uh, kind of similar to Java. And so this makes it pretty easy to, if you're a Java developer or done other languages that have a similar syntax, it's pretty easy to get going with Kotlin. Um, one uh, big difference that you'll see right away between Kotlin and Java is that the type information is specified on the right-hand side instead of the left-hand side. And uh, the reason for this is that this this enables the uh, language compiler to do something called type inference. So in a lot of places, you can actually leave off the type information, and uh, it's a lot easier to do that when it's on the right uh, hand side of the declaration versus the left hand side. And, uh, and so type inference does make the code uh, usually look a lot cleaner and, and uh, easier to parse and, and looks more expressive in a lot of cases. Um, you do have to provide those types usually on uh, function parameters and uh, but they are optional on like return types because they get inferred. Okay, so there's a couple of other interesting language features with Kotlin that I wanted to point out. One is that nullability is built into the type system. So you'll see that question mark after that configuration type. Uh, what's that saying is, is that that configuration uh, may not be there. Uh, it, um, it's not necessarily null. Uh, it could be null if it's coming from Java uh, and the, the Kotlin type system will, will handle that case for you. But this is saying we may not actually have a configuration parameter. And so then our code can, can account for that as needed. So that's one nice feature is having that nullability built into the type system. Another feature that's really great is first class support for lambdas. So these are, are functions, uh, inline functions that you can specify as essentially parameters to, a, uh, to another function or method. And so it's really nice to have a, a concise syntax to, uh, to define our functions. And this comes in uh, really handy in a lot of places. If you're doing Kotlin for UI programming, like in Android, uh, there's a lot of callback things that, the, that benefit from the syntax. If you're on the, the server side, then things like uh, being able to, um, to have operations that perform on a collection or a stream, it's really nice to have this Lambda syntax for having those functions for doing transformations or filters, that kind of thing. Uh, one other nice feature that I use a lot in Kotlin is this template expression syntax where you can inject uh, variables into strings so you don't have to do a uh, string plus and then another string, uh, that kind of thing. You can just embed the, the values right into the string template. So that's a nice feature. 
And then something that, uh, that a lot of people love uh, is that semicolons are optional. So in most cases, you can leave them out because uh, the, they can just be inferred by the compiler. So some other things that are a little bit harder to point out in a simple code example, but we'll get into a little bit later are coroutines. So coroutines are for doing asynchronous uh, concurrency ta background tasks, that kind of thing. A really, really nice programming model around that. Uh, there also in Kotlin is bidirectional interoperability with Java. So you can call Java objects and Java objects can call into Kotlin objects. And uh, interesting thing about Kotlin related to this is that Kotlin didn't build its own collections library. Instead, they used the Java collections library, but to enhance them, they use another language feature in Kotlin called extension methods. And extension methods provide a really nice way to interoperate with Java APIs. The Kotlin syntax is expressive and concise, and we'll see that as we go through some examples in a little bit. And then uh, it also, the, the way there's some language features in Kotlin that enable it, make it really great for building DSLs and doing uh, type safe builders. And we'll see some of that in a little bit. So why Kotlin? Uh, it's, it's fairly new uh, since 1.0. It was only about four years ago, uh, but it has grown a lot over time. It is now the, uh, the standard language for building Android applications, and uh, so it's getting a lot of usage from that, but it's now also growing in other areas as well, like on the server side. There's great support in Java web frameworks like Spring Boot for Kotlin and a number of other web frameworks and, and uh, RESTful frameworks that have great support. For, for Kotlin as well. Uh, and just last fall, Kotlin became the number two uh, most used JVM language behind Java, of course, and then uh, Scala behind that. So I overtook Scala on that list. So uh, a lot of great energy around, around Kotlin. Uh, another example that I, I find pretty compelling and something that I, I really love in, in Kotlin is uh, that in Java, we used to have to use uh, Java beans syntax to uh, write out our, our data classes, our, our ability to hold data in an object. And uh, you'd have to generate the getters and setters and uh, equals and hash code. And yeah, your ID can generate those for you uh, in your two string. But it sure is nice to have a concise syntax for defining these types of data classes that have values on them. And the, the two string and equals and hash code methods are all generated by the compiler. And that's just a, a data class in Kotlin. So that's something that, uh, that I use a lot, makes my code a lot, uh, a lot cleaner, easier to read. Okay, so we'll see a lot more Kotlin in a couple minutes, but let's go on to gRPC. Uh, so gRPC uh, combines together a couple different pieces. The first piece is protocol buffers, and protocol buffers are a nice declarative way to define messages and services. And then what we can do is take this, this uh, declarative definition of our messages and services, and we can uh, then wrap services around those things, actual services that we run and interact with. So the protocol buffers, they are language agnostic. So we define them in one declarative format. And then what we do is we generate from that declarative format the different uh, what are called stubs that we can interact with in Java or now in Kotlin or in JavaScript or whatever. So, uh, so the nice thing is we have that language agnostic definition that allows us to communicate between different things um, without having to write our, our parsers and our data objects and all that. In, in multiple languages. Protobufs also support, has great support for evolving protocols. So if we want to add fields to a message, we can do that and not break things. They're also strongly typed, so this gives us a, a strongly typed representation of our transport protocols. And so it's nice to have that uh, over uh, JSON, which obviously doesn't have any uh, strong typing to it. So what we do with, with uh, our protocol buffers is we generate our serializers and deserializers for our messages. Those get generated by the protobuf uh, com uh, proto-c compiler, which we'll see in a little bit. And then we also generate our service stub. So you'll see that in this example, I've defined a greeter and it has an RPC service. So it's something that takes an input and returns an output of those, those messages. And that what this will do is generate the client and the server to be able to use that service. So gener we generate both of those and then we get super fast network RPC. 
So the reason why we get super fast network RPC is one that the proto buff, uh, the protocol is very concise and that's nice, but also gRPC is built on top of HTTP2. And HTTP2 brings with it a bunch of great features for doing uh, this very optimized communication between a client and a server. So it uses by a binary protocol, which is, allows us to be much more concise. It has uh, stream support, so we don't need to use web sockets. Uh, we, we have native stream support in HTTP2. We can do stream multiplexing, so we can do multiple channels of communication over a single connection. And then it has other features like header compression to save bandwidth and that sort of thing. So, uh, so that is our, our quick rundown on Kotlin and gRPC. And the announcement that we made yesterday was open sourcing gRPC Kotlin. And what that is, is bringing together these two great, uh, great technologies. So let's run through a little bit about what it is and then we'll, we'll see it uh, for real. So what gRPC Kotlin does is it's gonna generate Kotlin friendly gRPC stubs for us. So the code that gets generated from our protobuf definition is going to work great with Kotlin. Uh, this is built on top of gRPC Java. So we're, we're building on top of that because there is uh, still a bunch of Java underneath the covers for a lot of this stuff. And so we build on top of that and uh, add the Kotlin friendly pieces on top. But we can then add support for nice things in Kotlin, like coroutines for doing async. And then also the flow API, which is a, a stream oriented API. So uh, coroutines is a, um, a metaphor or is a way to do an async callback. So you're gonna go uh, do something, let's say make a network call, and then we're going to get a response back. But we don't want it to have to block everything in the normal blocking Java world. Uh, the program wouldn't be able to continue uh, in that thread while we're waiting for that response to come back. But with coroutines, we can fire off the request and because we have a non-blocking uh, network channel to, to um, be able to not block on, then, then we get that callback essentially when, when the response comes back. And so coroutines fit really well with that async uh, call, um, RPC call. But the other uh, paradigm that we can be in is using streams. And a stream allows us to, uh, to broadcast events and then consume those broadcast events. And the Kotlin Flow API uh, gives us a nice Kotlin uh, way to, to interact with streams. And it's built on top of the, uh, some foundational work, the Reactive Streams project, which supports the ability to do back pressure on these streams as well. So some nice features for stream handling. So to use Kotlin gRPC, uh, gRPC Kotlin, uh, we are going to plug into a Maven or Gradle build using the existing protobuf plugins. So we'll uh, use the, what, if you were doing Java with gRPC, then, uh, then it's going to look very similar. And we'll see that in a little bit, just with the Kotlin pieces built on top. And all this is available today in Maven Central as version 0.1.1. Okay, so let's take a look at a demo and I'm gonna be showing uh, demo encodes for the rest and, uh, and um, feel free to ask your questions. And um, uh, David or Lewis or Brent, if there's any questions that came in so far that, that need answering now, feel free to chime in. Okay, so let's start with our very simple hello world uh, example here. Uh, I've got my, my Gradle project and I have defined some versions for things. I am including the protobuf Gradle plugin and the Kotlin Gradle plugin so that this project knows how to support Kotlin and, uh, and knows how to generate protobufs. So then I'm going to apply those plugins. Now I do need to include the gRPC Kotlin stub, and this is um, part of what we need to be able to, uh, once the code is generated, there's some dependencies in that generated code, and this is where those come from. Then we're gonna include our Kotlin standard stuff. We're gonna include our protobuf and gRPC standard stuff. So you'll see um, the protobuf Java, protobuf Java util. I'm using uh, Netty with gRPC as the uh, actual server and, and client HTTP implementation. And then we get into our protobuf 
configuration where we uh, are going to have a plugin to the Proto C compiler, which is going to do the Java Proto C uh, compilation. And then we're going to also do the Kotlin one. So we do both of those. And then there's a little bit more configuration in this, but, but that's kind of it. Okay, so then I've got my protobuf definition. My protobuf definition, I've defined my service, very similar to what you saw before. This is an RPC called say hello. It takes in an input of hello request and returns an output of hello reply. So then we can see our messages here. Hello request has a name and hello reply has a message. So that's our declarative uh, protobuf for our gRPC service. Then let's go over to our server, and our server is written in Kotlin, and there's uh, some work here that is just starting up the server, listening on a port, and doing that sort of thing, uh, and handling shutdown. The interesting piece of this is that I'm extending the greeter gRPC KT and the greeter coroutine impl base, and so that was generated from my, my protobuf, and now I create an instance of this class, and I override the say hello method and it's going to be, take the same parameters uh, just uh, that the that the uh, interface had which it came from that protobuf it's going to take in a hello request and return a hello reply and you'll see that this is a suspend fun which means that it's using coroutines to uh, to do this Okay, so what I'm gonna do in this case, I'm going to handle my request and how I'm gonna handle it is I'm going to create a hello reply. Uh, I'm gonna use the builder for it. I'm going to set the message in that hello reply to say hello and then whatever the name that came in the request was and then I'm gonna build that and you'll see that build returns a hello reply um, and uh, so that there I've implemented my simple server. So I'm going to start this server up so that we can see this thing actually work. So you'll see it's up and running, listening on that port. And then let's go take a look at our client. So for our client, let's first go down to our main method and uh, have to do a little bit of setup here to connect to the server. So here's where I'm doing my message channel builder, giving it the server that I wanna connect to, in my case, just localhost and that port. And then I'm going to tell it, um, create my hello world client. And so this was uh, part of the, the code that we'll see in a, in a minute. And then we're going to figure out what we want to send and if there was an argument to this program, then I'll use that. Otherwise, I'll just use world. And now we call the hello world client dot greet method and give it this string user. So let's go take a look at that and see what's in there. So we've got our hello world client. It takes in a parameter of channel, uh, which is closable. And then we're using our stub that was generated from, uh, from the protobuf definition. And now we've got this function greet, which takes in a name string. And then because we are using coroutines, we're, we need to, uh, in this case, we want to just run this thing, uh, send it the, the message, get the response, and then exit. And so the way in this case, instead of doing a suspend fun, is we're just going to say block on on this thing, run blocking, and we're going to assemble our request. So we're going to use that builder, that generated builder, set the name to the name that we got in, and then we're going to use our stub, which is our way to communicate with that server. We're going to call the say hello method, give it our request, and then when we get the response back, uh, which is asynchronous, but because we're in run blocking, it's going to automatically await this result for us uh, and um, in a, a non-blocking way, and then it's going to uh, get the message out of the response and output that. So that's our very simple hello world client. Let's run this thing and see it actually work. So there we go. We now see that the greeter got a message back, which was hello world, which came from the server, which combined the string world and prepended hello in front of that. So very trivial, simple example there, but hopefully that gives you a quick, uh, quick rundown of how to start building a gRPC Kotlin application with gRPC Kotlin.
Now, if we did want to go see some of the code that is generated um, by the Proto-C uh, plugin, we can come in here and look at our generated source and go into Proto and see the different generated targets from our build. There's the Greeter gRPC. Here's the Kotlin piece, of, piece that was generated uh, and some, some Java that was generated here with our, our actual um, uh, value objects, our hello apply, hello request, and the builders for those. Okay, so you might be wondering uh, about this builder syntax. That, that part is not uh, super Kotlin-y, and uh, it's, it's very Java-y. That's how we would do that in, uh, in Java. Uh, but Kotlin has data classes. And so wouldn't it be nice if we could also generate the Kotlin uh, idiomatic version of those data classes as well? And this is actually a project that we're working on for Kotlin protobufs, which will allow us to have a much more uh, Kotlin-y syntax for those pieces that we're currently using the Java gRPC uh, protobuf plugin for. Um, so that's a project that we're working on and, and coming soon on that one. Hey, James. Um, yes, we got, David. We got one question um, from the Q&A that it might make sense to answer um, uh, about the demo. Um, so one person, Anonymous, asked, um, does the gRPC Gradle plugin support the Kotlin Gradle DSL? Um, I can answer that one. Uh, it it does, but it's experimental. And I'll post a link. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. And thanks, David, for chiming in. <laughs> um, good to have you, you here helping. OK, uh, so we've got our, our basic hello world example. And I'm going to close those down because we're going to continue on um, with the, uh, the next example here, which is a Maven example. And I wanted to show you what the Maven build looks like for this uh, same sort of project. So if you are using Maven instead of Gradle, that's great. You can use uh, the, same, uh, the same sort of thing to, to be able to do this. So let's walk through the pieces here. We've got the Kotlin stuff. We've got the protobuf stuff. We've got the gRPC stuff, just like you've already seen. But then we also have a dependency on that gRPC Kotlin stub uh, version 0.1.1. And, uh, and so that brings in the dependencies that, that our generated code need. And then we're using the protobuf maven plugin and we're just using the the standard uh plugin for for generating our our protobufs and you'll see just like in the gradle one we're using grpc java to generate some of the pieces here and then we also have our grpc kotlin which generates the kotlin pieces and so this is from the the new open source project that we announced yesterday uh the kotlin plugin okay and then of course we have the kotlin compiler uh, plugin in here as well so i want we run through the proto and, and code on this one because it's the exact same of, as what you've already seen, uh, but I will share at the end the link to go get all these samples. Okay, so that's the, the Maven Palm build. Now let's go on to the next example. And for this one, uh, we are doing streaming. So in this case, we are doing server streaming. So what that means is that we have an R RPC, which is say hello stream. And this one takes a request, but then returns a stream of hello reply. So instead of just a single hello reply, it's gonna return a stream of them. So let's look at how this particular one is implemented. We'll start with the server, and it uh, is all very similar to the code that you've seen before, but instead of returning a uh, suspend fun with the hello reply like we saw before, in this case, what we're going to return is a flow of hello replies. So this is using the, uh, the Kotlin API for streaming, for, for flows, and so we're going to create a flow, and then my very trivial flow here, all it does is repeatedly, once a second, omit a hello reply and that hello reply is very similar to what we saw before. It's just the request, the name and the request, and that turned into a hello reply. Okay, so that's our server implementation. And then let's go take a look at our client. So for our client, what we're going to do is, again, we're going to run blocking because this is just going to, uh, to do its thing and then exit. And so we're going to create our request 
just like we did before. But this time, when we call that stub say hello stream and give it the request, what we actually get back is a flow. And so then we can do all sorts of flow operations on this thing. One of the flow operations is called collect. What collect does is every time there is a, uh, an element emitted from this flow, you can have a lambda function that then does something. And in our case, very trivially, we are going to just print out that message. Uh, so, and then the rest of this looks very similar to what you saw before. Okay, so, um, so we've got our server streaming example. And I did wanna show you that I could run this locally, but I did wanna show you that this all does work on uh, cloud services as well. And, uh, and we have a cloud service that runs these great, uh, which is called Cloud Run. And so in our example, this is the gRPC Hello World streaming example. You can deploy this on Cloud Run, and that will deploy, create a Docker container, deploy that Docker container on the managed uh, Cloud Run service. You could also deploy that container on Kubernetes or other places that run containers. And now I've already done that piece and deployed that application. So it's all up and running here on Cloud Run. And so that's, um, that's great that, um, that it's uh, up and running on the cloud, but now we need a way to run our client to call it. And so I'm gonna go over into Cloud Shell and I've already uh, set this up so that I can just do the Docker run and then I need to give it the parameter of the server to connect to and because uh, it doesn't know about uh, what the what the endpoint for that server is so i have to tell it and then i'm going to give it my docker container that i created uh, which has both the server app and the client app in it and of course you could create your docker containers however you want but i put them both into a single docker container and then i give it a parameter to say which process i want to run and in this case i'm going to run the client and so now that will uh, go get the docker container run it with that parameter and it's it's going to run that client that we were just looking at. So it's going to run this client that's going to make that request, but get the stream back and then output the results. So let's go over back to our cloud shell and you'll see that now, sure enough, our server is responding with a stream that's, uh, that's emitting a value once a second that's taking, in our case, the name that I gave it was just the server name that we were connecting to, but you'll see that now it's outputting that once a second. So it just will continually stream that output. Okay, so that's our server streaming example and, uh, and runs uh, great on Cloud Run or other places that can run containers or really anywhere that can run a gRPC uh, server. Let's take a look at our last example now, which is uh, taking this a little bit further. So we could also have a service that does client streaming. So in a client streaming example, we would take in a stream and then just return a single value. But in this case, we wanted to show bidirectional streaming where our RPC uh, takes in a stream, but then also returns a stream. And so let's, uh, let's look at the server for this one. So our server, implements that function that takes a flow of hello request and returns a flow of hello reply. And so I need to uh, somehow do something with this stream and turn it into another stream. And so a very typical way to do this on a stream is to do what's called a map. And a map just says, every time an element emits on this request, then do something with it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to print it and then I'm going to create a hello reply and this will just automatically get returned. And so that now has transformed my flow of hello request into a flow of hello reply. And so I've done my, my stream transformation. All the rest of this code looks the, the same as what you're familiar with. And so this is kind of like a echo, um, echo service. <laughs> uh, and so then on my client side, I need to give this thing a flow. So I'm going to assemble a flow and very similar to what you saw before, my flow is going to once a second emit a value, which is going to be my hello request. And so now this is a, a flow of hello request. And let's go start up our server, get that running while we're waiting, while we go through the rest of this. 
Okay, so now I have my client and I'm gonna call say hello on my client and give it the flow. And that's going to, uh, and well, let's go see, let's go look at that hello, say hello to see what happens. So this is a suspend function. It runs in a coroutine scope and you'll see that I'm calling my stub, say hello stream. I'm giving it my, my flow of hello request. And then every time I get an element, uh, a response, I'm just going to print it. So very simple examples here, but hopefully it helps give you the, the gist of using gRPC with Kotlin. So let's run this one, make sure that it works. So there we go, we see hello world repeating uh, every second. So that, now that's a bi-directional stream because my client is producing a stream that's going to the server, being transformed, and then being sent back to the client. Uh, and so um, there we go, bi-directional streaming there with, uh, with Kotlin and gRPC. Okay, so those are the four examples that I wanna show you. And um, I'll give you some information on where to find all those. So this is all in the slides, but we saw the code in IntelliJ. Uh, so the best place to learn how to get started is in the gRPC docs. You can go to the Quick Start for Kotlin and great documentation there. If you do wanna check out those, uh, those four samples that I showed you, those are on the uh, Google Cloud Platform, GitHub, and then under Kotlin samples, and then they're in a directory called run, uh, because those are the cloud run examples. Uh, so that's where all those examples that you saw are. Okay, so that was what I wanted to show you with gRPC Kotlin, and, uh, and we have some time now for questions, and we've got Lewis and Brent and David who will be um, helping us with those, and um, yeah, so let's see what questions there are. Awesome. Thanks, James, for a great presentation and demo. This is great. Okay, so I'll go ahead and read the question. We'll go ahead and dig in here. Um, so I'm probably butchering this, but Sharisha asks, I am looking into the GitHub repo of gRPC Kotlin. How can we start contributing to it? I guess you would just answer that through the docs, right? Uh, for actually contributing, which of course we would love contributions, we open source this so that so that um, we can get everyone involved in making it better. And so that is actually on github.com slash grpc and then grpc-kotlin. And yes, we would certainly love contributions to that uh, that repo. And, um, and so that's where the source code for the stub that I pointed out as a dependency and then the proto C plugin, uh, all the code for that stuff is, is all in that repo. So certainly would love contributions there. And I'd, awesome. I'd like to chime in, chime in right there also and just say uh, probably the best way that you can help is to use the library and, and give us feedback and, and report bugs uh, or issues if you find them and also, of course, fix those issues if you feel so inclined. And we do have uh, a running list of issues on that repo that you know, we'd be happy if anyone wanted to, to, to give a crack at. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. Great. Okay, the next question is from Subrat. Is it possible to return a file, uh, example, a zip file less than one MB as a response from gRPC server? Yeah, let's see, Lewis or Brent, do you have any insight on, on returning files? I mean, you, you certainly could, could just uh, turn the file into some bytes and send the bytes. Um, is that the best way to do that? Or is there a better flow or an end way to, to, do, um, to do file transfers over gRPC? Um, that's certainly how I'd do it. Um, just uh, with the with the bytes, turn them into a bytes, or would there be a better flow way to do it? Yeah, um, yeah, just turn them into bytes. Um, cool. I, I think gRPC um, isn't, um, single messages might have a cap. I think it's above a megabyte though. Um, but the worst case scenario is you turn it into a stream and concatenate them and send those messages and put them back together on the client, which should work quite well with um, the flows. That's a good point. I, I would guess that there is a way to go from a uh, input stream in Java to a flow in Kotlin. Um, that's, I haven't looked in that in particular, but I guess that there is. And if there is, then yeah, you could read your file into an input stream and then turn it into a flow and then stream it. But if anybody wants to try it, and if you have problems, then uh, please file issues on the gRPC Kotlin repo with that. Perfect. 
Um, Tommy asks, what's the biggest difference between Kotlin and Golang? Another great GMV option as it relates to GRPC. What is your number one favorite aspect about Kotlin? If you could change one thing to make Kotlin better, what would it be? So that's like a three in one question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for, for me, um, I do most of my programming on the JVM, and so so Kotlin's ability to uh, to interoperate with Java and be on the JVM is uh, is certainly uh, good for me. Um, there's also a lot of really nice functional programming oriented features in Kotlin that I really enjoy. Uh, if you want to take that really far, there's a functional programming library in Kotlin called Arrow, which is really nice. Um, so there's uh, for, for me and, and my preferences, I, I really enjoy programming in Kotlin um, for those reasons. But um, maybe Brent or, or Lewis wants to chime in or David with some other anecdotes on that. Um, nothing immediately comes to mind. Um, I mean, I can think of one or two things I might change about Kotlin um, to answer the last part of the question. Um, mostly, um better said static analysis plugging points but that's all i can think of <laughs> cool brent or david anything to add cool no, nothing over here nothing on my end <laughs> all right we'll move on to the next question Yarosh is asking uh, for container, containerized applications, how heavy are these dependencies? Was that a 256 MB image built? Yeah, so the 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 biggest dependencies in, in uh, really any Kotlin application that's on the JVM is going to be the JVM itself. And so I was actually just exploring uh, container layer sizes recently, and um, and uh, found that that about as small as I could get a Kotlin. A JVM based application was about 150 megs. Uh, a very small portion of that is the the generated code and the the stubs. Uh, and so really a lot of that is actually in the JVM itself. There is a technology that uh, Oracle is working on called GraalVM. And GraalVM allows you to take a Kotlin or Java or Scala, any JVM application, and compile it down into native code uh, doing ahead of time compilation. And when I did this on, it wasn't a Kotlin project, Project, but um, but I think you could find similar effects. I did this on a, a Scala project recently, and my output binary, my output container that can run without without any dependencies was 12 megabytes. And so um, so you you with GraalVM can get these things uh, a lot smaller. And uh, if you're doing, um, I ha haven't looked to see what the uh, GraalVM support for gRPC in particular is yet. Um, there is ways to get it to work with most stuff. It just takes a little bit of configuration where you have to specify any uh, reflection information um, through a configuration file, uh, but you can generate that that reflection, mostly generate that reflection uh, config file uh, using GraalVM. And so, um, so something worth looking into. And uh, as we explore that, we will be uh, sharing that on my Twitter and, and other places as well for doing gRPC in Graal. Um, that's a fun, fun thing that I will be looking into. So thanks for that question. All right, we just had a question related to that come in about Graal. Um, Graal VM would be tough, right? Since gRPC uses reflection, which uh, Graal does not support. So you can do reflection, you just, with GraalVM, you just have to have a configuration file that specifies the reflection information. And so I, I did this on a project recently, and let me actually go see if I can show it to you. Um, so this is a project that does a, a lot of, of reflection. Uh, I think there is even some, uh, uh, um, protobuf stuff in this particular one. And so if we go look at, uh, the, the, I'll show you the, um, on my GitHub, the configuration file for the reflection, you'll see that it is, it is a little, this is all the information that specifies all the reflection that happens. And so, um, so it, it certainly was possible. And most of this file was generated for me, but there were a few places where I had to, uh, to do some manual uh, tuning of this file to get it all, all working correct. So you'll see uh, 
there's some uh, com Google Commons, some stuff in here that was being used. So, so it, it is possible. I haven't done it on a gRPC application yet, but I will give it a try and uh, report back on my Twitter, um, which on, my tw on Twitter I am underscore James Ward. So, um, so follow me there if you are interested in updates on that. Okay, next question. Uh, Guido asks, uh, in server mode, do tools like vertx spring Quarkus support gRPC? There are some of those other server frameworks that do speak the gRPC protocol. Um, I, th I think most people that are doing gRPC are just using the out-of-the-box gRPC Netty server. Um, but, but yeah, there, there are other frameworks that do speak gRPC. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't know specifics on that. I don't know if anybody else um, knows, knows more about that. Brent or Lewis or April. It's certainly down. <laughs> Uh, okay, next question um, from Peter. Does gRPC support back pressure? Do you, sorry, using the Flow API? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so because it's built on Flow, it does it does support the back pressure in the Flow API. I, I was honestly, when designing it, was really pleased with how well that just worked together with out of the box, pretty much, um, which really improved my opinion of the Flow API. Um, yeah, the fact that it, it just worked is, is pretty awesome. Okay. Um, Shresh asks, uh, since Kotlin X serialization supports protobuf, can we use uh, serializable data classes directly, assuming my client and server in Kotlin? And apologies if I butchered that name. It's uh, serializable. Yeah, I think. Serializable. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so could you pass data classes around today? Um, the answer is no. Um, and I think uh, part of that is the last time I checked on Kotlin X serialization, when it says Kotlin X serialization supports protobuf, what they mean is that it, they support using protobuf as the um, like serialization in terms of how the message is, is stored, sent, converted into bytes, but not necessarily in terms of how the message is defined in terms of how the message evolves, um, and certainly not in terms of the proto language proto files or anything. Um, that's not, and that's what's currently supported. Um, so Kotlin X serialization doesn't currently work. Um, I know gRPC supports other serialization mechanisms and that um, could be made to work. I don't think we have that working with Kotlin at this time. Cool. Thanks, Liz. All right. It looks like we have one more question here. Uh, Malachi asks, um, how well does it work with Android, specifically thinking of the conflicts between gRPC, Java, um, for any timestamp and Java Lite used by Firebase, which conflict with one with each other? That's a good question. David, do you, would you happen to know that one? Um, I actually don't. Curious to hear if uh, Lewis and Brent have any thoughts on this. Um, um, I, I can take a shot, um, which is to say I'm not I'm not specifically aware of the nature of those conflicts, but I would be shocked if the situation was any different from gRPC Java, um, which is to say um, currently this gRPC. Oh, let me lose you, Lewis. <laughs> well, I'll take a crack at what I think he was about to say, which is that this, this uh, Kotlin library is built on top of gRPC Java, so it's going to have the same conflicts as gRPC Java has for Android. Cool. Hopefully that's something that the that we can improve over time and and so track us on the GitHub um, for uh, I don't know if there's an issue for this already, but if not, we should create one and and uh, you can follow subscribe to that issue. So yeah, I think it's a, a 0 0.1 point one version. We're not uh, sure how this works in the Android environment, but I, I know I personally have um, a project in flight to try to test it out. So um, awesome. Yeah, that goes. 
yeah, it'd be great to be able to talk from an Android client to a gRPC server. So hopefully that's something we can get working. So, okay, I think that's it for the questions. Christy, what else? Yeah, that, thanks again for a great webinar. Thanks, uh, James, for, for presenting and uh, to David, Lewis, and Brent for answering questions. Um, and thanks again for everybody for joining us today. Uh, a friendly reminder, the slides will be available and the recording of the webinar on the CNCF webinars page later today. Um, thanks again. Have a great weekend and we look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye.